hell? I'm hope. These videos are not for children. If you're a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infusa. I say this with no hyperbole, The Batman is my all-time favorite Batman movie. It's a movie that I think properly portrays the character and captures elements from the source in ways I don't think any Batman movie made prior to this has. One of the most important elements, of course, being its depiction of the Dark Knight himself. And that's why I'm here to talk to you about the Batman in The Batman. Now, I know this is a very divisive performance. You either love it or you hate it for a variety of reasons. Personally, I love it. And I think that some of the people who hate on it might be missing the point a little bit. Now, that's not to say that this performance is immune to criticism. It's not. No performances. But the arguments I've heard as to why this is a bad Batman performance, there are also some of the reasons why I think this is one of the all-time greatest Batman performances. Aesthetically speaking, I think this is absolutely the coolest on-screen Batsuit. I rank it right up there with the suit from Batman Returns. I really dig the armor getup, as not only does it make for a great look, but it does genuinely look protective, so its placement feels legitimate and justified. It's practical and purposeful. I always thought that the suit from the Dark Knight looked effective. I dug that it looked like armor, but I couldn't help but feel like it looked a little bit too bland and a little bit goofy. But the Batman gives you the best of both worlds. You can understand why someone would use this in battle, and you can also understand why they'd put it on a movie poster. It sort of reminds me of the suit from Arkham Origins, but like that suit meets the suit from Injustice. And seeing as those are two of my all-time favorite Batman attires, I'm not complaining, because I think it looks great. The only thing I'm not 100% on board with are those wristbands. I'm not really crazy about them, but they're also not the worst thing ever. They're kind of growing on me. I mean, I'm not learning to like them, but I'm becoming more tolerant of them over time. And most importantly, and before I even say it, let me go out of my way to say, I know this shouldn't matter. I know that I shouldn't care about it, but it does and I do. It matters incredibly to me. I'm really glad that they showed the black around Bruce's eyes. It's a small detail, but it's one that's gone overlooked forever now. And it has never not bugged me. Especially when we see Batman unmask in some of these movies. He has raccoon eyes when he has the mask on and a fresh face when he takes it off. I can't stand that shit. So props to the Batman for actually incorporating this into the movie. What's often talked down on is the fact that this Batman is all bat and no man. The Batman character is typically broken down into two different personas. Those being Batman and Bruce Wayne. One of these is the actual person and the other is the persona. And surprisingly, the one without the mask is the actual disguise. But in the Batman, there is no such separation. Bruce Wayne is just always Batman, with or without the mask. There's no public persona because this Bruce Wayne doesn't go out in public. Like his nighttime personality, Bruce spends all of his time lurking in shadows. Watching society as a spectator, but never actually involving himself with it. This Batman is a total recluse. A natural loner. He's a man stunted by the trauma he experienced at a crucial developmental age. Destined to live the rest of his days stuck in neutral. Emotionally paralyzed by the shock. This Batman, more than any other, still has his parents' death hanging above his head. His silence speaks volumes. He is still incredibly weighed down by that trauma. So much so that he spends his life closed off from the society that caused him such pain. He's broken to the point of almost being shattered entirely. What I really love is that his parents play an integral part in this story. Their presence isn't shown in a flashback or a dream sequence showing their death, but instead shown in the pain in Pattinson's performance. There's something so genuine in the sad, aimless way that Robert Pattinson plays Bruce Wayne. He makes Batman feel like a real person, a fundamentally flawed individual desperate to do the right thing even when he's not entirely sure what that is. The guy may have his parents' money, but he doesn't have their social standing. This Bruce Wayne was socially distant before COVID was even a thing. Not only is he not a social butterfly, 
but he's not even a social caterpillar. Not even a social butterfly egg. Now listen, it's up for argument and debate where his fighting and detective skills are at, but I think universally we can agree that his people skills here are a null time low. He's not making any friends. Bruce Wayne is a ghost amongst us. To be honest with you, with the way the story plays out and the way that Bruce is depicted as being a societal stranger, I don't think him having a playboy personality would have felt all that authentic. The whole Bruce Wayne character would kind of contradict the narrative. This Bruce isn't people privy yet. He doesn't like to be amongst people. It doesn't seem like he ever really spent enough time around them to figure them out. That's not to say that this Bruce will never be able to play that part, just he's not there yet. He hasn't had enough prep time. People attempting to discredit the movie for not having Pattinson play the part more smooth and suave really should be praising the project for showing how much the cowl has consumed his life. And not just his life, but his identity. Bruce is so hyper fixated on his role as a vigilante that he doesn't even have enough time to pretend he has a social life. We get a real feel for the deep, unhealthy obsession Bruce has with crime fighting. It's all that he lives for. He can't be bothered putting on airs. In the context of this particular movie, Bruce Wayne's infamous reputation is not needed. It's not right for the plot, and it's not right for the character. He just doesn't have use for that lifestyle yet. He hasn't figured out that he can do good both with and without the mask. This Bruce Wayne only exists when Batman needs to do some detective work incognito. Like I said, he just doesn't have use for this lifestyle yet. Actually, come to think of it, he doesn't have use for any type of lifestyle. The people in his alleged personal life don't know him personally. He's closed himself off from absolutely everyone, even those close to him. Somebody said they were close to me? He acts exactly like you'd think someone who spent his time in shadows would act. How a human who became an alien in his own society would interact with that familiar yet foreign civilization. Even the way this Batman walks and moves feels a little bit off. He sort of glides around. There's almost a phantom-like feel to his movements. And it's the details like this that allure people to Batman. The guy's a total outsider and it makes the few interactions he has feel that much more awkward. Look at how he interacts even with those who know and love him. He's socially scarred. This movie doesn't glorify or glamorize what it means to be Batman. Instead, it shines a light on all the ugly sides of the job. The toll this work takes on him, not just physically, but mentally as well. He's clearly unhealthy and unwell. This Batman feels as disturbed as the criminals he comes across, and Pattinson really captures Bruce's tortured psyche. He does so in ways that I don't think we've ever seen from a live-action Batman performance before. This movie doesn't make it look cool to be Batman. Instead, they portray it as the horrifically soul-draining experience it has to be, and it emphasizes the profound effect the mantle has on the man. This Batman doesn't feel fully in control of his emotions. It almost feels like that he himself is mere seconds away from snapping. He spends so much of the movie trying to get into the mind of a monster that he almost gets trapped there. Like a wise man once said, battle not with monsters, lest you become a monster. He's prone to aggressive outbursts, and we see him lose his cool entirely on an occasion or two. This Batman feels much more unstable than previous Batman have. Bruce is constantly keeping Alfred at arm's distance, never openly expressing how thankful he is for his services. Bruce and Alfred's relationship is strained to say the least, and that's the person who is closest to him. That's who he spends nearly every day with. The only man he's had is a father figure since he was about eight years old, and yet he doesn't seem concerned with his presence at all. Alfred takes a bomb to the face, and as soon as he wakes up from a coma, he's met with... Lied to me. There's a lot of hostility between he and Alfred. It's all one-sided and mostly makes Bruce seem like an angsty child lashing out at their parent, but the tension is very much there. In some ways, it feels like Bruce blames Alfred for gatekeeping the details of his parents' murder. But ultimately, what isn't revealed to him is only kept secret as to shield him from the truth. His parents were imperfect people, and in a moment of weakness, and more importantly, fear, his father made the wrong decision, trusted the wrong person. And ultimately, his decision, while somewhat justified, ended a man's life. All Alfred has ever done, he's done to protect Bruce. But Bruce, being the bat that he is, is blind to that. 
I think this portion of the film is tragically cut short, with very little payoff. It's probably the most disappointing arc this movie has to offer. It's good for what it was, but I just wish there was a little bit more of it. I can only hope that there's a further elaboration and exploration of this theme in the follow-up film. Alfred is far from the only person Bruce has a tumultuous relationship with. He has plenty of problems with the city that he's sworn to protect. I love the opening to The Batman. As a matter of fact, I think it may be my favorite part of the movie. It's a nice, subtle way of introducing the character of Batman, but more importantly, introducing the character of Gotham City. Instantaneously, we're shown how crime-ridden these streets have become, and we're let in on how far the corruption goes. In a matter of moments, we're given a brutal but accurate depiction of the city. But what I really love about this intro, more than anything else, is the perspective. Sure, we're hearing Batman's inner thoughts as Bruce provides the opening narration, but it's not his point of view that we're seeing. It's the city criminals. And I think that we learn a lot more about Batman's relationship with Gotham through their eyes. We see the fear that the Batman creates in the heart of the immoral and the unjust. This is something that is often talked about in Batman projects, but I don't think it's ever been shown quite as well. We're shown gang members, robbers, random thugs, all looking over their shoulder, afraid of being on the bat's radar. You have all these bad dudes see that symbol in the sky, and you can, for that very moment, feel their fear as they pray that it's not them he's after. So from the very beginning, Batman's presence holds weight. Before he's ever even appeared on screen, his impact is felt. I've always really liked the idea of seeing Batman from the perspective of those he encounters. I think it really adds to, and more importantly, highlights the mystique of the character. When you think about it, we the viewers are kind of spoiled when it comes to the Dark Knight. Like, he's still cool. Guy's gonna win all kinds of popularity contests, but we're too intimately involved with the character. We know his name, face, family, friends. We know his inner thoughts and feelings because of text bubbles and narration. We know the dual, dueling sides of his personality. As a character, we know Batman. We know Bruce Wayne. And because of this, he's a little bit less intimidating. We have a reasonable idea for what his thoughts are in every given moment. We understand what his next moves are because we were able to study him in passing. We don't just see the mask, we see the man underneath it as well. But in The Batman, we're kind of reintroduced to the character by seeing him through the eyes of those who don't know him but live in fear of him. There is no such comfort with this character. We're just immediately shown his violent vigilanteism. Furthermore, since this Batman is a Batman in his very early years, and he's only just begun protecting the innocent and hurting those responsible, you also get the feeling that there's no such comfort for these thugs either. Batman hasn't been around long enough for anyone to latch on to his moves and fighting style. Or hell, even his morals. Sure, this guy has a no-kill rule, but they don't know that. They're instead thrust into a one-on-one -on -one with this strange specter who stepped from the shadows. Even those he saves aren't entirely sure of what to make of him. Even the police, who he seems to have some sort of working relationship in this, are wary about him. When they're not blatantly talking shit, they're staring him down and giving him side eyes. These police officers are just looking at this man in a cape going, I know that bat doesn't have a badge. The movie really did itself a favor by setting the events of the film within Batman's second year. Because everyone knows of Batman, but no one really knows Batman. The guy's like a total Batman of mystery, which is good. I think the less familiar Gothamites are of Batman, the more the drama is heightened. There is so much more that can go wrong if the people that you're protecting don't know that you're trying to protect them. The margin for error is significantly expanded. The movie manages to tell us a lot more by introducing us to the concept of Batman before actually introducing us to Batman. More than just learning about Batman's perception, we're learning about the perception of Batman. And I think this serves as the perfect introduction of the character. I've heard some people claim that the Catwoman-Batman relationship in this sucked, and that the two lacked any chemistry and it made their scenes together awkward, but I don't really think that's the case. I mean, yes, I do think that there's an awkwardness to them, but that seems more by design than it does by mistake. And even if it wasn't, I think it works very well in the narrative's favor. 
Batman takes a liking to Selina instantaneously. There's not a lot of development there. He just sees her and then he's like, Damn, I gotta get me some of that pussycat. But isn't that to be expected of a person who hasn't had a lot of human interaction? Of course he's attracted to the first pretty face that looks at him. Not to mention that despite her rough exterior, she clearly still has a good heart. She's not a bad person, she's a good person who just sometimes does bad things. And for the world that she's involved in, sure, she could see that this dude is a total weirdo from a mile away, but a well-meaning person who's able to handle himself and help others is more than just a rarity. It makes sense that these two strange strangers would be drawn to each other. They're both in their own right protectors, and protectors who don't have anybody protecting them. Their interactions are usually stilted, but their dynamic to me makes sense. Plus, I feel like all the awkwardness comes from the man cosplaying as a bat. The, the cat lady is perfectly normal here, which is a sentence that has probably never been said before. If there was any dynamic in this movie that stood out above the rest for me, it's the Batman and Jim Gordon dynamic. And I can honestly say, this is my favorite version of these two characters in live action. Or at least on their situation shit. Don't get me wrong, I was very fond of how the Dark Knight movies portrayed the two. But I think in the Batman more than there, the two come across as partners. They were always allies before, but you get a real sense of the two actually being a cohesive team. Not only does Gordon bring Batman onto active crime scenes to aid in GCPD investigations, but the two also operate outside the system entirely together. What makes this incredibly impactful is that this isn't a friendship. Make no mistake, these two are not friends. They're almost strangers. Technically speaking, one of them doesn't even know who the other is. This is a partnership brought on by a shared need for justice and a mutual respect. Gordon actually trusts Batman more than he trusts people on his force. He relies more on a masked stranger than he does on those who share his uniform. I find this association to be one of the all-time highlights of the film. It's also probably the closest thing to a healthy relationship this Batman has. Though I guess it shouldn't come off as a real shock, considering that this union is brought on by a shared interest in Bruce's obsession. If anything, this is the one healthy extension to Bruce's unhealthy infatuation. Another interesting relationship is the one between the Batman and the Riddler. The movie sets these characters up to juxtapose them against each other. The two are incredibly intelligent, masked vigilantes who are looking to rid Gotham of crime. And then underneath their masks, they're two overly obsessed orphans. On paper, the two sound quite alike, but in execution, they couldn't be any more different. Yet it is in fact Batman who inspired the Riddler's actions. Without knowing it himself, he helped influence this madman. This crazed nut who doesn't see himself as the Dark Knight's enemy, but instead his ally, playing some sort of twisted game with him. The Riddler takes Batman's act to new extremes leaving behind piles of bodies in his wake. He becomes a public punisher, putting the corrupt out on display and using death to discipline them. In his mind, he and Batman are just alike, two branches from the same tree. But to Batman, they're not even in the same rainforest. What I really love about Batman's relationships in the Batman is how each person unknowingly contributes to the making of the Dark Knight. These characters supply this young vigilante with a mind and heart like a sponge. Whether they're conscious of it or not, they're adding to the mythos of the world's greatest detective, essentially becoming the blueprint of the hero's morals and ideals. This Batman is depicted as being a little bit judgmental at first. He had his own beliefs on criminals, believing them all to be selfish and immoral. But he realizes through his interactions with Selina that sometimes it's easier to persecute than it is to understand. He figures out that his upbringing wasn't the same as everyone else's. Not everyone is functioning under the same frequency, living life having the same experiences. And from the admittedly very privileged life that Bruce leads, he has the ability to wag his finger at others for stealing, because he himself has never had to do that to get by. The idea of stealing is so foreign to him, but he sees this action as being a determining factor if someone is good or bad rather than seeing it as people struggling to survive. Maybe that person is stealing because that's all they can do. I credit this Batman for being hard-headed, but not so stonewalled and set in his ways that he blocks out differing perspectives. Catwoman unintentionally makes Bruce a better Batman, simply by knowing him and offering up a different worldly perception. Batman's talks with the mayoral candidate make him realize that he isn't alone in his mission. 
he's not the only one doing their part. He also realizes that despite all that he's doing, he could still do more. Batman is always going to be essential. It is Bruce's major contribution in life. That contribution essentially being his life itself. But Bruce Wayne can also be an instrument of good. The persona wasn't just developed to throw enemies off his trail. It was also created to contribute major donations to charities in need and to give to a community that isn't given all that much. The eventual mayor, sorry for spoilers, gives Bruce this very epiphany. And it makes it feel like this movie closes not with an ending, but instead with a new beginning. The start of the next chapter in this Batman's legacy. In addition, it's also because of how he inspired the Riddler that he realizes he needs to make a change. He can't seek justice acting solely on vengeance. It's just not enough. So moving forward, he makes the conscious decision to try and represent hope. Not just fighting crime, but also providing comfort to the unfortunate adding compassion to his arsenal, showing the good that they're not alone, and that there's more than just wicked in this cesspool that is Gotham City. This Batman may have been born out of vengeance, but he lived to become a symbol of hope. He still pursues justice, but his reasoning for doing so is different now. It seems much more selfless. He's no longer just blindly trying to avenge the ghost of parents he heroicized. This Batman is now trying to make a difference. Still fighting, but now fighting for a better world where no one else would have to go through what he went through. I credit the Riddler with this, but I think it's actually a combination of Bruce being inspired by the other heroic and anti-heroic figures the city has, while also fearing what he could become, what he could inspire, what he might currently be seen as. All of these characters unknowingly guide Bruce down the path of becoming the symbol. Which, apparently, is also a point of contention for people. Because they don't like seeing Batman being led. But a Batman who doesn't learn is a Batman who doesn't succeed. When you think of the standard interpretation of the character, you're seeing the sum of all different types of training and life experience melded into this one person. Someone who's been taught by Ra's al Ghul in the League of Assassins, Henry Ducard, and Alfred, amongst others. You're not seeing this Batman learn from others because you're seeing a final product. This Batman ain't there yet. So reasonably, I would think this Batman should be learning along the way. The Batman I know is a Batman who's learned from people from all different walks of life and used that information to become the best version of himself that he could be. So not only do I not mind this Batman being in the learner seat, but I also wouldn't have him anywhere else. The fact that he doesn't know as much as we're used to is not discrediting Batman. It's showing how this Batman's youth and inexperience may play against him. Another really great benefit to come from making Batman a rookie is that it powers him down. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey V, how can he be powered down? Batman doesn't even have powers. Batman's just a man. Yes, Batman is just a man. A man who's been trained by the most deadly assassins the world has ever known, with an infinity amount of money and gadgets and overall detective knowledge, who can stop anybody doing anything so long as he's granted prep time. Oh yeah, that and he's also got an entire squad behind him who all have the same exact skills, and when he's not hanging out with them, he's with his super friends. Yeah, I don't care if the guy is human. It's about time that we admit to ourselves here, as much as we may love him, Batman is ridiculously OP. Which is why I think if you want to tell a really good Batman story, you either need to go to the start or stop by around the end. For me personally, the best Batman stories are stories centered around when the character was either really old or when the character is really young. You can't just put Batman in his prime out there and expect anyone to think that he's not going to make it out of the situation. Old Batman works because while he's had all this training and all this life experience, he's still an old man. The passage of time is working against him. The man could still kick someone's ass, but there's no guarantee that he won't break his hip doing so. He's not as fast as he once was, he's probably not as strong as he once was, and he's also significantly more fragile than he once was. Not to mention that the experience that he's gotten may be null and void at this point in life. The world changes, and so do the criminals in it. Alternatively, young Batman may be inexperienced, and may even be less thoughtful or bright due to being significantly greener. Perhaps his lack of time put in makes him a second-rate detective. Maybe he didn't complete his Batman training yet. 
he may not be as skillful or resourceful as the Batman that we know. Now, that's not to say that he's particularly bad in any of these fields, but that's to say that a much younger version of the character would be much less good. Which gives some more realistic leeway for villains to get one over on the Cape Crusader. There are so many more possibilities with a Batman who is still learning, rather than a Batman who has already learned. Personally, I'd love to see a Batman movie series that only ended when he became the Batman of legend. Don't start us with him in his prime, end it with him in his prime. I find it really bizarre that some internet personalities are trying to claim Batman is underdeveloped in this movie when this movie is all about the development of Batman. He grows both as a hero and a person throughout the runtime. He's continually progressing with each and every scene that he's in, and every interaction that he has. By the end of the film, Batman's motivations completely change. While he's introduced as a broody, brutal beat-em-upper, the movie ends showcasing him as a selfless savior, a hero. What I love about this movie is what seems to be the direction. It allows an audience to witness Batman's defining moments. This movie is essentially a making of movie. Seeing Batman transition from vigilante to full-blown hero. Showing him letting go of his vengeance and embracing hope. Some people seem to find this to be counterproductive to Batman's cause, probably because there's a lot of people out there who believe Batman is vengeance. And to be fair to them, there's plenty of valid reason to think that. I mean, it's only been told to us over and over again by the guy himself. I am vengeance. I am vengeance. I'm vengeance. Vengeance. The word Batman and vengeance seem to coexist often, so I could totally see why someone would say Batman is vengeance, because it's sort of true. Although I think that statement should come with a little bit of an asterisk, because Batman isn't just vengeance. What often gets understated is Batman's compassion. Everyone's so quick to talk about what he can or can't do or who he could take on reasonably. They get so wrapped up in the fighting and contingency plans that the character's heart often gets totally overlooked. Luckily, this film didn't make that mistake. This Batman, while silent and scary, isn't beyond sentiment. He's definitely closed off, but he's still very clearly empathetic. That final speech at the end of the movie isn't Batman dismissing his crusader career. This isn't him hanging up the cape. This is him realizing that vengeance isn't all that drives him. He's not just trying to strike fear in the hearts of the bad. He's also trying to provide comfort to the good. So I think a lot of those claims are completely without merit. I just don't think that people are used to seeing Batman be a work in progress. But I think because he is, it gives fans more to look forward to as time rolls on. The character saw an incredible evolution in this movie. I think it'd be a real shame if that evolution stops here. Now I will admit, if this performance is the be-all, end-all, and we do not, in fact, see a steady progression from man to symbol, I do think some of this might lose its charm. I would definitely look at this interpretation differently, and I probably wouldn't like it as much as I do right now, but I also wouldn't dislike it. Pattinson is enough of the Batman I know for me to be fond of his time in the role, and I think that in general is a phrase that accurately describes everything done with Batman in this movie. Just enough. As a crime fighter, he's effective. He's a solid fighter, but he rarely leaves battles without bruises. There's some well-timed punches thrown in Dodge, but there's also some well-timed punches thrown at him that absolutely connect. In terms of his detective skills, he's very perceptive, but he's still green in the field. While he may pick up on things that Gotham's finest overlook, he himself is not beyond making similar mistakes. And when he does have the answers, they don't just come to him effortlessly. Sometimes he needs to do a couple mental laps before arriving at the destination. Ultimately, what I truly love about this take on the character is how Robert Pattinson captures a lot of the character's core elements while not coming off as a total replication. He excels in Bruce's natural stoicism, his lack of reaction to major moments, his stern cadence, managing to make his words sound both monotone but meaningful. In a lot of ways, he's the Batman I know and love. However, there are certain characteristics that this Batman doesn't possess at all. He doesn't speak with the same level of confidence you'd expect Batman to speak with. There's no surety in his words or actions. The guy's constantly second-guessing himself. But I don't think this is so much a flaw in the performance as it is a function of the character. This Batman is not the myth. He's the man creating it. If he doesn't seem sure of what he's doing, it's because he's not. 
This movie lends just enough credibility to Batman without making him feel complete. Robert Pattinson's Batman is the most human of the bunch. It's a fantastic performance by a great actor in a series that has unlimited potential. Do I think he's the best Batman? Well, no. Not yet, anyway. But you know something? I think he just might be in time. I love the Batman. And I love the Batman in the Batman. You know what, Rob? I hated you back when I was in high school. Because I had to sit through every one of those dog shit Twilight movies because the girls that I dated around that time loved those things. You basically slaughtered the very concept of vampires and you did it with a glitter bomb. But after the Batman, all's been forgiven. We're even, man. I mean, between this and the lighthouse, we're good. Clean slate. Come over anytime. And if you love this video, and would be interested in hearing me talk more about the characters in the Batman, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, I'm vengeance. With all that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight, and that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.